our special guest coming up, Kristen Karras from Dance Safe. Kristen is the director of operation at Dance Safe, and so she contributes to the strategic planning, project management, you know, the chapter development, their programs. She does a whole bunch of things for Dance Safe. And so during her time at Dance Safe, Kristen has provided many services for people, particularly at national events like Tomorrow World, Lightning in a Bottle, Imagine Music Festival, EDC Las Vegas, and the Global Eclipse Gathering. And on top of her work with Dance Safe, Kristen has also worked with a number of drug policy and harm reduction organizations in their local in her local community in the Denver area. She also serves on the board of the International Drug Checking Day. And so at the end of the day, the reason we've got Kristen on is that she's passionate about ending the war on drugs and making the world safer. All right, Kristen, thank you for being on. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Perfect, perfect. So thanks for being on. And why don't you go ahead and just introduce yourself to us, how you got involved with Dance Safe, what you do at Dance Safe, you know, introduce us to the organization. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, first I'll introduce Dance Safe. I think that'll provide more context for how I got involved. So Dance Safe is a 501c3 public health nonprofit that promotes health and safety within the electronic music and nightlife communities. We are a chapter-based organization, so that means that there are actually 24 um, independent organizations that we license our name to um, that carry out um, our services for us. Our services are provided at music festivals and other nightlife events. Um, you can find um, our volunteers on the ground at events, either at a table or behind a booth, um, providing services such as free water, coupled with information about heat stroke, um, free earplugs, information about hearing damage, uh, safer sex tools like external and internal condoms, and uh, factual drug education coupled with drug checking when we're allowed, which I believe we're going to get into drug checking a little bit more later in the episode, so I'll leave it at that. Um, I got involved with Dance Safe in 2014. There was um, a program called the Visionaries Program um, that was the support and promotion team of Dance Safe online. Um, I had found Dance Safe because uh, my friends when I was in college started dabbling with substances other than your standard cannabis caffeine um, and alcohol. And I had asked them if they just, you know, knew what they were getting into, to which they had told me no. And so um, I took it upon myself to step into the role of being their peer educator. And through my research online um, regarding like drug education, I had stumbled across Dan Safe, and that was my introduction to the larger drug policy reform movement as a whole. Um, and Oh yeah, what was the, you wanted to run down on Dan Safe and me? There's a third part though. Well, tell us a little bit. So you, Dan Safe runs services in, in festivals and raves and things like that. And mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about the drug checking component. Yeah, absolutely. So drug checking is considered to be a, um, a public health tool, a harm reduction tool, where we are determining some or all of the contents of a particular substance. Right now at DanceSafe, we are currently offering reagent drug checking. Um, so reagent drug checking is a presumptive um, method of identification. This means that we're able to determine the presence of a substance, but not the purity or potency. Um, we are, though, currently fundraising to be able to purchase a more advanced technology where we'll be able to have a more con comprehensive breakdown of all the substances within the sample that is provided to us. Um, currently, for the reagent drug checking, um, participants will come to the booth, ask for drug checking services, we'll bring them to a private area, um, then they will um, provide... Uh, between like one and seven pen tip size samples. So like the size of like the ballpoint of a pen tip. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that is when we're able to apply the reagents, which are a mixture of sulfuric acid and other um, 
and chemicals uh, that are then dropped on to the sample that's provided to us, at which point we are able to observe a color change. These are colorimetric tests. And so, for example, if someone was bringing us MDMA and we were using a marquee reagent, um, uh, us as a team, um, we all know that a marquee with MDMA would turn a purple color, whereas if it was another substance and it was misrepresented at point of sale, um, then it very well could be turning another. And that is how we're, we do that with a variety of different substances, I mean, excuse me, with a variety of different reagents so that we can reduce the risks of false positives and negatives. Um, and that's a quick rundown on how drug checking works. Got it. So so someone could be at, at, a, at an event and they would go to the dance safe booth if you will and they can mm -hmm. say okay I, I think i've bought mdma can you at least you would be able to verify if it's at least there yes and so messaging is really important in what we do we don't take our job um lightly um in regards to offering this type of education to the public and so um if we were able to detect the presence of mdma we would say this is an mdma like substance we would not say this is MDMA because to say this is would say this equals MDMA, and there could be other contaminants that we are not being uh, that we're not detecting in the subs in the substance or in the sample. Um, and so the messaging is super important. Um, we make sure that we walk every single participant through the limitations of reagent drug checking um, before the service is provided to them, um, so that it, they have a clear understanding of what that language is and why we're using it, um, so that they can use that within their own risk assessment that they engage in after receiving additional information from us. Got it. And I, I noticed the Dan we looked at the website before we had you on, of course. So mm -hmm. we also saw that Dance Safe sells testing kits as well. Now are we those the level that you just talked about where they can mm -hmm. verify if it's there? Yep, absolutely. And that's why I think that reagent drug checking, honestly, is going to continue to be re relevant for the foreseeable future. Um, I definitely would love to see us going in the direction um, where people are able to have centers where they're able to drop in for more advanced drug checking. But even in countries where the, that is being um, offered, there are still some like logistical barriers um, to overcome, in which case having a reagent drug checking kit, which is something you can be using at home, um, our fentanyl test strips as well, um, are things that people are able to purchase online and they're able to uh, provide drug checking for themselves and their friends and their peers at home, the same that we would uh, offer at festivals at the moment. Okay, you mentioned fentanyl. Mm -hmm. Fentanyl has been all over the news and it's had a really terrible effect on a lot of people. You, so you mentioned that you have testing strips now. Is that a similar product specifically designed for fentanyl? No, actually. So these are um, immunoassay test strips. And because they were initially intended for the use of urinalysis, they are able to detect um, the metabolites at very small quantities and which makes them highly effective for detecting fentanyl and its analogs. Um, so there are a variety of different drug checking, I mean, excuse me, fentanyl test strips that are out there. Um, we specifically purchased from one distributor after conducting some studies um, with a uh, uh, with a university, uh, we had come to find out that there's some that were just like not as, as effective. They weren't able to detect nearly as many analogs of fentanyl because it's just not fentanyl that's out there. It's fentanyl and it's analogs. Um, and then there's cases where there are some strips that were sold, which unfortunately were just unable to detect anything. Um, so it's definitely important that you're choosing to get your fentanyl test strips from a reliable vendor. Um, and we started carrying those. We've had them uh, for a while now, and they've been wildly popular. People ask them about us all the time, whether they're um, asking to purchase them or to receive the service in person. Um, and so it's been really encouraging to see the community's like response um, in choosing to utilize that as an additional tool in their arsenal um, in terms of taking care of their own health and safety. Right. And has fentanyl been, have you been finding that laced with just about everything or is it more specific drugs? I would say it's definitely more specific drugs. Uh, primarily, certainly it's um, widespread within the entire 
like within um, opiates, it's very common. Um, we see a lot of reports um, regarding fentanyl being found in fake pressed pills, um, whether that's fake pressed opiates or fake pressed benzodiazepines. Um, that seems to be uh, rather popular. There's also been reports of fentanyl being found in cocaine. Um, so it's definitely being found in other substances other than opiates. Got it. Got it. So what, how does, what does checking do for the public as a whole? Yeah, um, I think that there's a couple different ways in which uh, drug checking is useful. Um, first and foremost, I mean, on the individual level, um, we see that participants who um, engage in drug checking, first and foremost, they're going to have more information about the substance that they're potentially intending on consuming. Um, but in the circumstances where someone brings us a substance that they were not intend that it wasn't um, what it was supposed to be, as in it was misrepresented. So, for example, in the event that someone was looking to partake in MDMA, but upon um, drug checking services being provided, they find out that it is like an ethylpentalone or another cathinone. Um, in many cases, uh, folks will choose to discard the substance. Um, in a study that was conducted surrounding this very issue with Johns Hopkins with data of ours, um, from my, I think like 2013, 2015 in that range had found like up to, I think it was like over 70% of participants who got unexpected results chose to discard their substances or chose not to partake. Um, and so we are definitely finding that there's evidence to suggest that the information provided to folks is in fact changing their health behavior. Um, in the case of fentanyl test strips, I know there was also a study that was conducted by Brown University where folks were also um, not only engaging in the a disposal of substance, but in the event they still chose to consume, um, they were doing things um, like in the event that fentanyl was detected um, in a supply that they were intending on to consuming, they would do other um, uh, health behavior modifications to reduce their risks, whether that was having naloxone on hand, having a friend present, um, and other interventions. So that's very promising. Um, it's also I think useful for us to have, um, depends on us, but it's definitely useful for our, um, us to have a better idea of what the overall drug supply is looking like, um, because that can better inform our services. Um, so yeah, at the end of the day, I think drug checking is a really important um, public health tool when you're talking about, especially when you're starting to talk about, um, in the case of um, a fentanyl test strips, where I think um, some of the uh, behaviors may be more likely um, to be leading to overdose. It is like a way for people to be mitigating risks, and that means we are helping prevent medical uh, adverse medical incidences and even deaths. Right. It's it's not a market where you know you, you can you can get the label that says you know certified on it or anything like that. So in this yeah, case, it's sort of like absolutely. the truth will set you free and. You know, information is key. Now, for those yeah, people, absolutely. For, for the people that are watching that might be wary about really engaging with drugs in any form, uh, you know, they might ask the question, doesn't, te doesn't testing or checking encourage the use of drugs? Yeah, absolutely. I think that a lot of folks who initially get introduced to just harm reduction in general, any practice of harm reduction, um, there's fear that um, by talking about it, we are somehow um, inherently um, condoning it. But I really do think that when you start looking at what always has been implemented, I think the question is, the much better question is like, can you show a case where not providing this type of information has saved a life? Um, because at the end of the day, like humans are going to continuously to engage in risky health behaviors. Um, I would also play devil's advocate in um, what some of your viewers' views might be of drugs. Like, are they consuming alcohol? Are they consuming caffeine? Those are regulated drugs that we have access to, and therefore there's a very much different 
culture around them and understanding of them and like practices that are out there um, as well. So I think that's something worth keeping in mind. Um, but at the end of the day, like harm reduction is all about meeting people where they're at. And these folks have already made the choice to engage in this behavior. And so instead of telling them just not to, um, the whole just say no campaign that, you know, was really driven by uh, the D.A.R.E. program was really ineffective. And in a lot of cases, um, also uh, resulted in a lot of mistrust. Um, if you're like spreading what are lies and not facts um, about these different substances, and then people start talking to other individuals and friends and peers that have like tried LSD or tried mushrooms or tried um, cocaine or some other substance, and they didn't have a bad time and they actually had a good time because people engage in drugs because they're fun. Like then there's going to be a huge issue because they're going to be like, well, in this lived experience, like these people have engaged in these behaviors and all the terrible things that I was ever told would happen to them hasn't happened. Um, and so then that results in mistrust. And then when you really are trying to convey a message that is really important and like that something is in fact truly risky and requires like that much more um, thought, um, it could very well fall on deaf ears. So I think it's very much a disservice, um, especially to youth, um, to not be providing this type of info information to them. That's a fascinating point. And I want to ask you my last question. What else can people and organizations do to, to participate in the harm reduction movement? Oh, goodness, there's so many different opportunities, um, no matter where you are, if for some reason, uh, you know, you're interested in getting involved in different harm reduction efforts, I would look, I would suggest looking into seeing if you have a local um, harm reduction center, agency, coalition, um, there's plenty of different opportunities um, to get involved with syringe access programs um, out there in the Laxone distribution. Um, of course, I'm going to suggest that you can get involved with Dance Safe. If you go to dancesafe.org, you can go to our Get Involved tab, at which um, you can follow um, a link to our online volunteer training. So anyone, no matter where you are um, in the United States, you're able to access our online training. And if you live near a Dance Safe chapter, we'll place you with them. And if not, we can talk to you about starting one in your local community. Um, if you are interested in making a difference, um, but uh, have like lower capacity and like have time constraints, like of course, be considering giving these different organizations donations. Um, there's plenty of folks who are registered nonprofits like Dance Safe, we're 501c3 um, and donations to us are uh, tax deductible. Um, and then something else that I think a lot of people don't always uh, always consider is you don't always necessarily need to get formally involved in an organization to start making a difference because a lot of this is related to um, kind of just like re-educating and putting education like back out there um, for people to have a better understanding of these topics and it, it goes a long way to have a conversation with your friends and your peers because at the end of the day like at least for dance you know we're based off of peer-to-peer -peer education because it's so effective like people that have like shared life experience, background, et cetera, are going to be able to feel like they can identify with the person delivering the information um, so much better. And so talk to your friends and talk to your peers. And if you see that there's like legislation up that can open up access um, to these services, like make sure that you're calling your representatives and um, you know emailing um, folks to let it know that you support these um, evidence-based efforts. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for being on, Kristen. That was all the time we had. Again, everyone, you can find Kristen Karras at dancesafe.org. She's the Director of Operations. Thank you so much for being on, and uh, we'll talk to you later.